So, so if you can hear my voice, which is a bit crackly, I'm afraid, um, ravaged by viruses. Um, uh, you know, so so my my background is I, you know, I've been making games since I was uh, Nitro Builders age, um, originally with things like MK14s and um, build your own hardware um, of, very, of various kinds. Um, and um, I had a fairly longish career in, amongst other things, the game industry. Um, you know, I worked for Psygnosis back in the 90s um, and um, Sony for quite a, quite a big chunk of my career. Uh, made some games like B17, The Mighty Eighth, um, and uh, a, few, a, few, a few other games like that. Um, which were fairly well received, but not terribly, terribly good sellers. What, what you really need to make is um, is Fracky Bird if you want to make a lot of money and not spend millions of pounds developing World War II flight simulators with realistic terrain. Um, that would be a crazy thing to do. But, um, anyway, so um, if uh, this, what, what I'm going to do now is kind of talk a bit about, you know, sort of, so I, I, was, I didn't know whether we're going to have like a room full of professional game devs or um or you know people are just kind of curious about games so i'll i'll kind of t i'll take it so sort of fairly gently and kind of talk about what kind of goes into a game and um uh what you know, what kind of games we have and uh what tools we have in rust which would definitely make that make that very easy um you know games have changed enormously since since i i were a little lad and um uh, so when, when i was little everything was focused on graphics and making making the graphics look nice but that's kind of easy now and um uh what we're more interested in is um reaching reaching networks of people and talking to people and um behind the scenes doing lots of stats on 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 our group of people and keeping them interested in our game um so uh big studios tend to kind of focus on that kind of stuff these days more than all the all the sort of uh, the sexy stuff, which is the you know sort of building nice three D graphics and um, uh, and and that that kind of stuff. So um, you know, so get so a game like Fortnite, for example, is that, you know, very very much it's got it's got a lot of sort of you know, very nice physics and three D graphics and shaders and all that kind of stuff. Um, I could talk a little bit about that as we as we go along, um, but the heart of it is. Um, some something something you know a, a very 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 nice sort of social social engine where you can hang out with your friends and do dances and and shoot each other which is all you need to do really i suppose in a game um so um uh and, and, and you know but much of that now in order if you're to build a you know build a fortnight now then there probably are a whole bunch of bits lying around um you can kind of put together to make them so you know for instance we have sort of very old game engines like like unreal which i think is now sort of coming up to its 30th birthday um and um so it's you know, and and some newer ones like roblox where you you can kind of build games in a social environment um so my son very you know, very much into roblox um you can build a game very quickly and scripted in lua um, which is a, a very popular programming language for writing uh, gameplay in um anyway so let's let's kind of skip forwards and have a, have a bit of a look i need to click on this here we go so um so 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 if, if you're building a game from scratch and and if you really if you're really serious about being a game programmer you should know how to game write games right from, right from scratch as as, as as right you know right right from um bits and bytes up to pixels on the screen um then Rust is quite you know, quite a good language for that. Um, so Rust, um, the problem with C++ in the past or C was that um, getting all the libraries to work together was a real pain in the backside. Um, so if you wanted to build, you know, sort of back in the 80s, if you wanted to build a game in C, then you had to kind of get a 3D graphics library like DirectX or OpenGL and kind of make it work, import, write a library to import some graphics into it. Then you had to write another library to, to um, render text, you know, write another library to build your 3D world and do BSP subdivision because there weren't any Z buffers back then, and so on and so forth. So you had an awful lot of work to do before you even got even got a few pixels on the screen. Um, and um, whereas today, uh, with languages like Rust, there's 
there's a huge sort of ecosystem of bits and pieces um, which you can kind of put together to uh, to to build your game. So, um, so in, in particular, you know, sort of how can Rust compete with decades of C++ game development? So, um, we we first first I, I first started using C++ in um, uh, at the end of the eighties, in fact, um, when it was just becoming a available as a language um, and uh, I, when I joined Cygnosis my, my job was to promote C++ to Cygnosis amongst other things so um, my job was to go go around and bang the drum for C++ because a lot of people were still using C um, and you know people like John Carmack used C to write to write do, you know, uh, Wolfenstein and Doom and so on um, and Quake, they were, they were all written in C, but they were about the only people at the time who were writing games in C. The, the game industry proper was kind of moving to, very much moving to C++ at the time. Um, and now C++ has had a sort of 20 or 30 year run, or 30 year run, well, maybe longer than that. So um, um, nearly 40 year run. <laughs> and uh, and now, now, now Rust is kind of taking over from a lot of that space that, um, uh, that that uh, C plus plus formerly had, but it's a kind of a slow process, a bit like a bit like it was with um, um, a bit like it was with with um, C and C plus plus getting into the game industry um, so early on. So there so there are some studios which use Rust, like Embark Studios in in um, uh, in Sweden. In fact, there's a whole bunch of stu studios in Sweden using Rust. Um, a, a lot of the more modern things, like you know. Uh, sort of so, social games, uh, very much using Rust, for instance, and um, uh, so in particular for a for a socially orientated game, you tend to build the server first and um, and add the pretty graphics later. So so you know if you've got Unity or something, you can kind of bang the pretty graphics together in almost no time. Whereas the writing the server is a much more challenging challenging task, and making making convincing gameplay is an even more challenging tasks than that. Um, so I, when I was kind of looking around for people using Rust in games, I, I found this excellent game, game, uh, website called Are We Game Yet, which is um, uh, a very nice title. And uh, so if I can, if I can uh, get this thing to work, then uh, this, is, this is that website. And, uh, and I recommend you have a bit of an explore here if you, if, if you know a bit about sort of games. Um, then uh, you, you probably have to have a look down here. So um, th these essentially are all the bits you need to build the game. Um, and the games come in a huge number of different flavors. So um, there's a lot of 2D games, for example. So uh, you know, worms or, or, or um, uh, 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 you know, sort of um, angry birds, which is pretty much the same thing. And uh, all, all, those, all those sort of 2D games uh, you, you tend to use a sort of specific library like this sort of 2D sprite engine set. Here we have 20 different 2D sp sprite engines for Rust. Um, and just by clicking on these things, you can use them immediately. Um, the problem with C++ was it was, you always had to fiddle around and try to get the thing to compile. It would only run on one platform typically. It wouldn't, you know, it would, it would run on Linux or Windows, or but never both. Um, and um, so it was always it was a big pain in the backside because these things tend to work multi-platform right, uh, right out of the box. Uh, uh, if you want to load 3D models into your 3D game, you need a, a 3D format loader. So um, the sort of favorite one is probably FBX. Um, and uh, so FBX is exported by all the, all the sort of favorite three, 3D packages. Um, it's a, it, technically it's a proprietary format, but lots of people reverse engineered it, including myself on a few occasions. Um, and you can you can you can export FPX models from Blender and uh, Maya and a, and a few other um, a few other um, uh, 3D editing packages besides, and kind of import them into your game. So that bit of the that bit of the the coding, which would have taken us sort of about three or four weeks at the start of the start of developing a new game, is all kind of done for us. Um, there's a whole bunch of 3D rendering stuff, which I'll probably talk a little bit more about later on um, and a whole bunch of AI stuff. So AI in games is kind of different from AI in, in, um, 
in sort of business analysis or whatever. Um, AI in games is about sort of making convincing looking humans. Um, and we cheat a lot when we when we do make AI in games to make convincing looking humans. It's a bit like it's a bit like our friend um, who starts with G and ends with E or um, or Alexa. I, I shan't mention the name of the one that starts with G because it will res respond and say something like, um, "Okay, Google, what's pi to a hundred decimal places?" Three point one four one five nine two six five three five eight billion nine hundred and seven. Okay, Google, stop. <laughs> So, um, so that's the that's the AI we're kind of used to. But uh, AI in games is is also about making fake humans. Um, but usually they run around and try to shoot you. Um, so another component of a game is animation. So um, uh, animation here, um, uh, there's surprisingly little in animation because animation is a very big subject. So animation goes from everything from um, sort of rigging, skinning characters to um, uh, to um, I've got Google going on in the background because I've got two speakers. <laughs> and it's animation. Animation is everything from sort of rigging, skinning characters to uh, you know physics-based animation, which is really quite sophisticated. Where you can get uh, even robotics techniques to get characters to walk around and collide with walls and things like that. So um, um, I had some friends in Brighton who were building Star Wars games, for instance, and um, they did a really lovely piece of physics-based animation. For the um, the the ATATs, um, which are kind of wandering around, you could trip them up with wires and this kind of stuff. And uh, that was that was really a very a very nice piece of work. Um, but, um, so I placed a few students there. Um, audio is also very important. So there's a very old library called FMOD in in games, which um, helps us uh, you know, produce sort of three D three D sound. Three D sound is sound where you you make a you make a sound in a three D world, and then it, have, it sounds like it's coming from the left and the right, which is the easy one. But but also it can sound like it's coming from up high or down low. Um, so from the frequency spectrum of a sound, you can you can tell whether it's a high or a low sound as well. Um, and there's things like Doppler shift as well. So and we've got you know sort of a whole bunch of other things as well. I'm not going to go and go into all these things. We've got physics, for instance, and mesh tools for doing poly stripping and um, uh, you know, building collision volumes and this kind of stuff. So there's a, there's, a, there's a huge, huge variety of bits and pieces. And VR, of course, very you nice know, with with um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg making 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 everything meta. Um, where uh, VR has become suddenly popular again, um, uh, even though it's actually been around since the 50s. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting. Um, uh, oh, what's his name again? Um, uh, the guy who wrote the um, Mythical, mythical, the mythical uh, man month, uh, Fred Brooks, and uh, he's pretty much the father of VR. And um, but he was doing it back in the fifties on giant IBM computers, which is quite quite astonishingly amazing. In fact. But, um, but uh, we're still catch we're still getting there with VR. Are we are we there yet with VR? No, maybe not. We'll, we may we may we may be we may be at some time in the future. We'll we'll see. So um, kind of back to my slides. Um, so, uh, so these, you know, so these, this website kind of gives us these, these, these bits and pieces. That, that there's also some sort of ready-made games um, out there. So, you know, these, this is like 20 action games written in Rust, um, and um, um, so, uh, so, so uh, we can kind of, you know, see. Um, I've lost my timer as well. Oh, we go. So I don't want to run on, run on for too long. Um, if, if if I start running on for too long, then then shout at me and um, and 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 say you're going on too long, Andy. It's very boring. But, um, but um, well, I will. There anyway. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll I'll stop in a bit and ask some questions if if anyone's interested. Um, and uh, I'll just kind of go through this screen and. Kind of talk a little bit about these these various games. So, um, you know, obviously, card games. Um, card games can be very, very, very complicated. I had a Chinese student who was building an incredibly complex card game um, for for months and months and months. And um, first person shooters, of course, we know about sort of Unreal and Unity and um, all the games that they make, like and Quake, of course, the sort of you know the granddaddy of um, of of um, PC 
first person shooter games or the first person shooter games being long around long long before long before quake um on consoles but, um, and um uh open world games um kind of you know things like minecraft is kind of an open world game we kind of build things wander around the place to, um, and, and see stuff um then we got you know special things like racing and role-playing games and so on you can see those these are all pretty well represented in the rust space and the, these are the only ones that people have found and put on, put on this list um, so there's lots of sort of ready-made games that you can kind of have a look at and see see how they're done so if you wanted to build puzzle games or card games you could you could um have, have a look have a look at how they're done um, so um uh that's the sort of, you know that's sort of the basics of sort of ready-made games so I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a second see if anyone's interested in asking any questions on what i've talked about so far and a tumbleweed uh, so feel free to answer any questions you can either open up your microphone and speak or just type it into the uh, box at the uh, bottom Andy, you're muted. Yeah, just just interrupt me if you um, um, uh, if, if you want to know anything a bit about a uh, bit about what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, I, I could do sort of uh, uh, the kind of talk I used to do for the BCS um, and sort of describe sort of you know how how games are made from uh, and how to get a job in the game industry, which was kind of what I was what I was pitching pitching originally. But, um, um, so, Rust, uh, everything Rust is crates. Um, a crate is a is a library, typically in Rust. Um, you can have crates with programs in them, and there are a few of them, but there are very few compared with um, uh, uh, crates with libraries in them. So it's a bit like Node.js. Um, so we have a thing called Cargo, which is like NPM for managing those crates. Um, but all you need to do is kind of put the name of the crate into a into a manifest file it will download the download the all the necessary bits to make to make that crate work so you can um with with great power comes great responsibility so when you're a beginner at this stuff you end up using every crate you can possibly imagine and your program will just not build in any reasonable period of period of time but whereas when you when you become a, an old and wise programmer like myself you tend to do everything yourself and not use other crates um but occasionally I need to use I need to use crates for doing stuff I really can't be bothered to do, like writing compilers, um, uh, which I have done in the past, but I don't want to repeat it just 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 because I need one temporarily. But, um, so um, Rust is kind of you know, built built up in crates. Um, it's, it's very very quick to um, kind of uh, uh, get get that kind of thing going. I can kind of show you his his a. Uh, um, is a, a multi-user dungeon engine I've been building um, very lazily, and I, haven't, I probably should do a bit more work with it. So, um, and um, uh, this this is kind of the dependencies section for for my for my Rust code. Um, I just I, I need this thing called. Obviously, I need to make my logging look pretty. So I've got this thing called Pretty End Logger, which kind of colors colors the logging and makes it look pretty. Um, and I'm using this library called ASIC STUD, which is a um, uh, an I/O library for doing multi-user networking. So the whole idea of this game is that hundreds of people log on, where potentially about ten thousand people could log on at the same time and all share the same world uh, without too much difficulty. And uh, that's a bit difficult to do in other languages. So you'd struggle to do that. Uh, you'd struggle to get above about two or three hundred in in Java or 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 JavaScript, for example, whereas Rust will definitely cope with 10,000-ish uh, without without too too much trouble, um, as long as you're not doing graphically intensive things. Um, so in this case, it's just text. So you 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 log in you log into a window, you know, or a web page. You you type, um, you know, use key or something, and um, it opens opens up a magic room. You can go into the magic room. So it's all it's all text based, but but it's very very simple which means that it's very easy to kind of extend and you, you could you could convert this into a full sort of minecraft like 3d world if you if you really wanted to um actually in many ways that's the easy bit these days um 
getting the networking right is is by far the the most difficult bit. So so in a in a multi user dungeon game, for instance, we have um, we have a world, and basically the world just consists of a bunch of locations. Um, each location has a name and a description and a bunch of commands we can use in in that location. Um, and the command is basically some text you type on the command line and then an action, which is represented as a kind of slash, a slash command, which gets executed if you if you say, so if you say sort of go north, then it would, it teleports you to to the location north of your current one, for example. So uh, um, it, it kind of essentially connects the human language with the, the mechanical language of the um, of the program. Um, uh, we, we also have a state. Um, a state uh, is consists of um, things in the world. So we've got users in the world, which are people. Um, uh, so it, that's distinct from people who are logged in. Because the same person can be logged in to the same character and, and move them around through two, two different connections. So um, we have peers um, who are logged in and characters users in the game who are represented by a single character. Uh, and um, so users have a place in the world, like in the throne room or something. Um, and uh, they may also may also have some items. Um, so they and and a bunch of other things. So they may have an inventory for the inventory for the Viking items. So uh, uh, we, we we can kind of man manage that state. The state is distinct from the world. Um, the, when we save the game, we set, we only save the state. Um, so um, much of much of the world is static. So we we just kind of load it, and we can only read it. Um, and uh, the 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 work the world uh, the the state is stuff which changes. So when I move from one room to another, my location changes in the world. For example, that's the state. So um, a bit like in if you know your Spanish, there are two words to be: um, estar and uh, a ser, uh, ser is the the stuff which has always been and will continue to be into the future. Whereas estar is the stuff, the state stuff, which is which is ephemeral and and, and will change. So uh, and games of games are very much like that, where where the world is split into immutable and mutable things. Um, uh, so I mentioned a peer. A peer is a connection through to through to a person and. Um, when you connect to a server, typically you, you connect with a port, and this thing kind of assign and you know, maps a port to a person. So when um, I Andy had logged into the game, I got my my character called Bilbo. I'm kind of moving Bilbo around in the world. I might also log in from my phone and move Bilbo around in the world as well. So I can have multiple peers who are talking to my who are logged in as my single my single user and. Um, uh, and that kind of stuff. So anyway, this is kind of an example of of um, sort of rust rust game building. In this case, relatively simple rust game building. Um, a, a, lot, a lot of it, <coughs> a lot of it um, uses this thing called async. Um, so, for instance, this is the teleport command. Teleport command uses async, um, and async allows us to um, uh, to Take, take and handle events without tying up the computer and using too much time. Um, so async is the the key to key to doing all that. We can we can also make um, uh, things which happen over a period of time. So after ten seconds, this thing happens, and then this thing happens, and then this thing happens. So uh, very much like coroutines in languages like C sharp and uh, Lua, for example. Um, and if I wanted to incorporate Lua scripting into this game, I could do that fairly easily. Uh, using one of many, many, many Lua, uh, Lua Rust bindings, <laughs> to, which are which are available. But anyway, I, this was just a this was just a play thing to um, to learn a little bit about um, Rust networking. And um, I was hoping to teach my son about Rust networking, so he could he could do a bit more with that. Um, so um, so it obviously multi-user dungeon engine is very boring. Um, so um maybe maybe, maybe um uh something a bit more fun will involve some 3d graphics um so re really the, you know if you're building your own 3d engine from scratch then first thing to do is load some 3d graphics and um, this this um, fbx <coughs> library um would be would be a pretty good good place to start um so 
So typically when you're when you're building a game engine, the first thing you do is draw a triangle just to prove you can do it. So um uh so typically my job was always when we had a new game console like the GameCube or the PlayStation 4 or uh, PlayStation 1 or whatever, and then um it was my job to kind of port the game engine to that new that new platform. And um uh, the first thing you do typically is draw a triangle. And um so uh to, to do that, we use we use um, a 3D graphics API like um, uh, these days Vulkan or or WebGPU are probably the two the two the two best. But you've got to get some triangles in to be able to draw them. So so a, a character in your in your in your game is essentially a bunch of triangles and um, and these these create like BXL DOM and um, uh, Blender uh, Blend, which is a, a Blender importer um uh kind of allow you to kind of get those triangles into your game and then then once you've got a whole bunch of triangles wow the game actually takes shape pretty quickly after that and uh but the mc stuff is is only really part of the part of the story what what do you want to kind of move around in your game and interact with your game world and what we need for that is a bit of physics um so here is a a 3d engine written in rust it's not just a it's not just a um a facade on um uh uh you know uh, you know one of one of the many many 3d engines so for instance the the popular 3d engine um for commercial users used to be havoc and uh, which is a very very well written piece of software um naturally multi-threaded um using some very good maths um and um, a bunch of very clever people from trinity college working in the dublin brewery um, built that um <clears throat> then uh uh Erwin Kuhmann's built um oh uh, I can't remember the name of his engine, so we'll probably remember. And um uh and uh, that became sort of the first proper sort of open source game uh game physics engine. That's, that's pretty pretty good. I think Erwin now uh works for Boston Dynamics, or he was working with Boston Dynamics last time I saw it. Uh, or NVIDIA actually, I think, these days. But um he um those those sort of big dog robots are kind of work because of uh because of owen's physics section and um uh all the sort of uh the, the physics necessary to to make those dog robots walk around uh came came from um owen, owen's work primarily um, so um uh so vr of course we want to do some vr um and um open xr is the sort of the the sort of proper way to do VR these days. Um, in the early days of VR, there were a lot of proprietary VR environments like Open VR, which it wasn't as open as it sounds, um, which was essentially um, and um, uh, uh, the the um, Oculus Rift development kit and all this kind of stuff. So, so this is actually a sort of fairly fairly good sort of open uh, open VR environment, um, well regulated. Um, Right, right. Once for this, it should work on everything from your phone to your to your Oculus Rift to your um, uh, to the to the, you know, the other three D engine of engine of your choice. Uh, for for rendering, um, it's well worth learning Vulkan from scratch. Um, so I've, I've I've done a few open source projects in Vulkan, including a a Vulkan wrapper of my own uh, for C plus uh, plus called Vuku. Um, which is still relatively popular in the C++ world. But Volcano is a very similar kind of thing that's done in the Rust world. Um, but Vulcan is, is extremely difficult to get going. Just to draw a triangle typically requires thousands of lines of code. So um, you, need, you need all the help you can get to, to draw a triangle in Vulcan. But once, you, once you've got it going, it's awesome. Um, and um, you can draw an awful lot of triangles. And um, I've got some amazing demos I did when I was building uh 3d mo molecule viewers where we have molecules with millions of atoms in them and uh, all moving and, and flexing and and uh and uh, uh in interacting in very various ways um quite unlike academic uh, molecule viewers um so Vol volcano is, is quite a good rust wrapper um but probably these days you probably want to have a look at web gpu which um which essentially is vulcan but um but also runs in a whole variety of different environments. So it runs in web browsers, uh, it runs on Apple machines. Uh, Apple were opposed to Vulkan for quite a long time, runs on Windows machines, um, 
runs on pretty much pretty much everything um android phones every, pretty much everything you can possibly imagine um so web gpu is definitely a definitely the place to look if you're building a 3d engine from scratch these days but again it's mind-bogglingly difficult to build one so if you're building your first open uh, 3d engine then use opengl opengl particularly opengl es is um, by far the the easiest way to get started in, in 3D graphics. But even then, it requires quite a bit of maths. You need to, need to learn a bit about matrices to get started. Uh, any questions at this point? Um, is everyone happy? Um, I guess I guess there probably are. I haven't had a look. Um, so um, yeah, so, so cheating is definitely a, definitely a, um, a problem. Um, and um, uh, for instance, um, even if you use blockchain technology, um, there's been some, you know, some a, a recent case where someone stole about six hundred million dollars worth of worth of NFTs from a from a from a game game developer. So, so it's um, it's very easy very easy to spoof your packets and um, do man in the middle attacks on games. So, um, um, that uh, there there probably are, probably are some 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 anti cheat anti cheat bits and pieces for that. Um, um, so, uh, Paige, I, I'd recommend you go to are we get, just Google for are we game yet, um, and um, uh, and you should, should be able, should be able to find this. Um, but you know, to explore the individual crates a little a little more, and um, hopefully you'll you'll find you'll find um, uh, find bits and pieces um, uh, in there. But um, yeah, so so just just have a dig around, dig around. So so there are explicit networking libraries, for instance, which is where the anti cheat thing comes in. Um, it's a bit like it's a bit like Bitcoin actually in many ways, um, doing anti cheat stuff because you you have to get consensus from your from your from your clients. Um, so games usually use a client server server model, but um, more ambitious projects are using um, uh, uh, blockchain like techniques to to share. share Share the game world, and so we don't have a centralized server, and that's that's quite a bit more difficult to do. And making that bulletproof is very difficult. So, um, so um, all right, okay. Th thanks for thanks for thanks for links, and um, so but but have you know, have a have a good old dig around and find things. But you know, start start by drawing a triangle and kind of work up to to um, uh, you know sort of social games. So certainly you. Um, Things like Twitter, for instance, is um, and uh, thing and Discord, for instance, they're both highly programmable through APIs, and um, you can build games on on these platforms. You know, so you kind of you know, do like a um, you know a, a treasure finding game where you kind of go out and you tweet tweet that I'm at this location and look for this secret clue, and it will give you uh, it'll kind of march around the countryside looking for looking for physical clues, for instance. That's a Kind of you know good application of those those kind of things. Those uh, those kind of games are easier to build from when you start than um, uh, you know sort of trying to build full three D games, which uh, is a totally insane business. But once you're good at it, you're good at it, and you'll be able to be able to get a job with a with a major game studio. Um, but you need to you really need to be able to build three D engine from scratch to 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 um, get a good job in a in a game studio. It doesn't involve just sitting sitting and testing games all day. And um, so, if you want to do some proper development, you need to know how to build a three D game engine from scratch. So, um, so I mentioned FMOD, which is a, an audio crate. I won't do much more about that. Um, so, full game engine. So, um, so this 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 one is a component based sort of game game engine. Um, uh, this one's called Bevy. Um, I haven't tried it. Um, you know, if if you do, then then just just tell tell me how you get on with it. Which will be interesting to know. Um, this is a component based game engine system, very much like uh, Unity. If you if you work with Unity, then Unity kind of bungs together a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, dynamic interfaces to call components, and um, you can you can sort of build build games build go games with components. If if you're new to game game development, then start with Unity, um, absolutely hundred percent, or Roblox. Um, if you can get get a, if you, if you don't mind the fact that the average developer um, age is about fourteen, and they'd be really really good at it. 
Um, so, so but Roblox is another way, but you can script Roblox with Lua. Um, but, but Unity is, is, is definitely a good way to get started with sort of writing writing games. Uh, yeah, Unreal is pretty good if you work a blueprint, but um, you really need to know C++ if you're going to get a job with a game studio. And um, you can kind of get, get by with blue, Blueprint. Um, uh, but writing C++ code on Unreal is, because it's such a big game engine, it's, 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 it's not a pleasant experience, shall we say. So, uh, here's another one called Piston. Um, and um, again, I haven't really used this, um, but it kind of show, you know, shows, the, shows the sort of fall. Um, I think I picked Craig's, which had a good sort of down, download download amount. So um, yeah, so um, so the, these things are not as popular as Unreal. Um, but if you're going to get a job in the game industry, then knowing this kind of stuff is better than knowing just how to add another sprite to Unreal. And um, so so um, there are actually millions and millions of people who know how to who know how to who to write and how to write blueprints for Unreal. But a handful of people um, who know how to write um game in, game engines from scratch and how to how to drive gpus and write shaders and uh interactive physics systems and all that kind of stuff but, um so so you, you need to know the difficult stuff if you want to know that stuff so um yeah this i mentioned async this is kind of an example of async in rust um so you have a, in this case we've got a character you kind of goes to the castle, waits 10 seconds, and comes back to the drawbridge and repeats it at infinitum. I'm guessing Jerome is popping up on the screen because I'm running out of time. So uh, oh, well, I'm, I'm quite sure. We have a notion of the, uh, an hour and a half. We're 45 minutes right. in, Andy. So, um, yeah. And I appreciate this. It's a fabulous subject. And you could, we, could, we could do several meetings on it, one yeah. after the other. But, um, uh, OK, well, I'll, 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 <laughs> wind, I'll, wind up, I'll wind up at this point. So, so yeah, so. Rust has got a bit of a way before it catches up with C++ in popularity, but it's definitely in terms of making games, but it's definitely, uh, if you're starting to learn uh, low level game programming from scratch, I'd definitely start in Rust now. Uh, my feeling is that many, many, many of the jobs are gonna be in Rust um, in in five, five or 10 years time. So if you're kind of planning a career in, career in um, uh, low level game development, which is the, where the big bucks are, um, then, um, well, maybe not. <laughs> you're not just finance, you've got the big bucks. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's, where, it's where the fun is. And um, if you want to work on the latest game console, then um, you need to know how to draw triangles on, on the PlayStation 20 and something. So, um, uh, so, um, so you know, in conclusion, you know, so the, the, um, the future of games is probably in Rust. Um, but it's it's not at the moment because we have, you know, we we had you know sort of bear moths like uh, Unreal and um, uh, and CryEngine and all all, the, all these other all these other things, which were all written in C plus um, plus. And there's there's thousands and thousands of game engines all written in C plus plus. There's a whole generation of game programmers all trained up on C plus plus. Getting them to migrate to, to Rust is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, so. Um, uh, it's going to be it's going to, it's going to take a while to make it migrate. Um, it's not like in the early days of games where there were a relatively small number of people writing games in C, and C plus plus was a challenger. And um, uh, so it's going, to, it's going to take a while. But I, I feel there's definitely a future for rusting rusting games. So, anyway, thank you very much, and um, let's, let's let's wind up at that point. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. And Andy will be around all um, all evening. So.